Good afternoon. It's Tuesday, March 15th, and we will be discussing Schindler's List, directed by Steven Spielberg. Well, welcome, everybody, and thank you for coming out. Uh, um, in this, this movie is obviously a lot more serious than a lot of the others that we've undertaken over uh, uh, the last couple of years of these things. Uh, I, I have on some level uh, tried to keep it light, you know, uh, uh, so maybe we can say that it's a, a sign of um, uh, the the Im impending openness of the community and things like that that feels okay to do something a little more serious recently and to talk about uh, uh, Schindler's List, which uh, there's no way to make a list of real Jewish classics without including this on the list somewhere. So uh, um and, um, so I really wanted to include it and really want to talk about it. Uh, the, the few things in, in setting up, just uh, pay attention to. Um, so um, this movie was made in 1993. It was nominated, um, say, I think for 12 Oscars. It uh, won uh, for Best Picture and Best Director and Best Screenplay uh, for Cinematography art direction, um, editing, and score. So um, so those are the ones that won. So it didn't win for uh, best actor or supporting actor. It was nominated in both of those categories for Liam Neeson and um, uh, supporting actor uh, Ray Fiennes. Um, it did not win for costume, sound, or makeup. Um, some of you I'm sure are wondering, so, well, if this didn't win for, uh, you know, acting what did. So uh, Tom Hanks won the Oscar for best actor that year in the movie Philadelphia. And um, Tommy Lee Jones actually won the best supporting actor award for the movie, The Fugitive. So um, uh, perhaps of less interest, but for completists among you, uh, uh, The Age of Innocence won for costumes and Mrs. Doubtfire uh, with Robin Williams won for makeup. So, um, but uh, in, you know, in, in any way you look at it, uh, the number of Oscars that have won uh, signals that it was an important film and remains one uh, today. Uh, John Williams wrote the score and um, he's worked extensively with uh, Steven Spielberg over the years. Uh, there's a story about this that when um, uh, Spielberg approached him and asked him to write the score for this movie, he said, you, you really should uh, get a better composer to write the score. And Spielberg said, I would, but they're all dead. And, um, so uh, whether that meant the, that uh, he was thinking, you know, uh, Beethoven or Bach or somebody like that, or whether he was thinking of the many musicians who actually died in the Shoah, um, I, I don't really know, but interesting uh, anecdote. Yes. Um, the producer of the movie is a guy named Sid Scheinberg. He's the guy who actually wrote, uh, he bought the rights to the book back in 1982 when it was published. The, the book was published, I seem to remember seeing it published as Schindler's List, but I think that was after the movie came out because it was originally published as Schindler's Ark, um, uh, similar to the idea of Noah, that uh, to be uh, brought into uh, Schindler's factory was like being brought onto Noah's Ark and the possibility of survival um, be, because of that. So um, um, uh, Sid Scheinberg bought the rights to the book by Thomas Keneally, who's an Australian, um, uh, not Jewish. I think he's well known for uh, historical novels. Um, in, and uh, Schindler's Ark is, is based on fact, but you know, it's one of those things that are based on a true story, right? So, um, so there are some changes here and there to uh, the fact, some composite characters and things of that nature. But of course, the 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 main character, Oscar Schindler, is a real person, uh, as is the uh, uh, camp commander Amon Goth uh, was a real person, and and of course we see um, through the the course of the movie. Uh, some of the characters who we then see the actual human counterparts uh, still living in, in 1993, um, who um, um, 
who are real people. But there are some composites as well. Like ben Kingsley's character, Isaac Itzhak Stern, is a composite character. I mean, he was, there, there wasn't just one uh, bookkeeper accountant for the, this business. Um, and uh, his role is, is probably the most enhanced sort of role in the movie, perhaps. But um, uh, going back to some of the technical things, some, the, the cinematographer, Janusz Kaminski, has been nominated for seven Oscars for cinematography. He won twice, both with Spielberg as director, this movie, and for Saving Private Ryan a few years later. Um, so uh, Sid Sheinberg bought the rights and uh, tried to get uh, Steven Spielberg interested in making the movie uh, back in the, in the early 1980s. Uh, Spielberg, for his part, um, was interested in seeing this movie made, but didn't think he was the guy to make it. Um, but in 1982, when this book came out, I mean, he was still best known for movies like uh, um, Jaws and Raiders of the Lost Ark. Uh, he himself didn't think that perhaps he was up to the, the serious nature of this movie. And, uh, but he decided to uh, try and get somebody who would do a good job with it to do it. So he actually, uh, Spielberg signed on as a co-producer with Sid Sheinberg and tried to get, um, among other people, um, he was, he talked to, um, uh, my gosh, uh, uh, the, uh, the director of Rosemary's Baby uh, and uh, the fearless vampire killers, Roman Polanski. Um, so he was interested in getting Roman Polanski to uh, make this movie, not even realizing that Polanski actually grew up in, um, in Poland uh, and uh, was in this uh, um, ghetto in Krakow that is depicted in the movie. So um, uh, Polanski uh, turned down the, the opportunity to make this movie. He didn't think he could make it um, without coloring it too much with his own experience. Um, it's a number of years later, of course, where, where Polanski actually does make his uh, uh, Holocaust movie, The Pianist. Right? Um, the other person who, uh, um, or one of the others that, um, that Spielberg approached was a guy named Billy Wilder. And I, I think we've talked about Billy Wilder in the past. Uh, um, uh, another uh, director who's a Jewish refugee from Nazi Europe um, made uh, great movies in America of all kinds, um, perhaps best known for Some Like It Hot, right? And actually it's Billy Wilder who convinces Spielberg that Spielberg can make this movie. And, uh, and that's when Spielberg agrees to take it on for sure and approaches his uh, uh, production company about the possibility of doing it. Um, and get some pushback, right? You know, uh, again, here's the guy who's made all of these uh, um, beloved classics, you know, uh, E.T. and Jaws and uh, uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark. And um, the response from the uh, production company is, maybe you should just make a big donation, right? And, and not make a movie like this at all. And, uh, and Spielberg not getting much... Um, uh, positive reinforcement for making this movie was convinced this that this movie would not make a dime. That that this was was uh, uh, I don't know if you would call it a labor of love exactly, but that it was something that he felt at this point that he had to do, but he didn't expect uh, anyone would notice it. Frankly, I mean, uh, you know, he did not really have the sense that that this would become. Um, not only a well-respected movie, but actually a profitable movie. Um, uh, that kind of surprised everybody that a three-hour black and white film uh, at the time that it was made in the 1990s would uh, do as well as it did actually at the box office. That said, um, one of the reasons that Spielberg was particularly interested in making it and, and very attached to the, to the idea of this movie was uh, that he had this sense of uh, 
you know, there, there was a rising acceptance of, um, of those who would deny that the Holocaust ever existed. So one of the things that he set out to do with making this movie was to um, uh, make a, a movie that would get people to understand what had actually happened and that they would not be able to deny it, right? And so th this is a, a, it's kind of a complicated thing when you think about it because, you know, uh, this is a movie, right? It's not a documentary. It's, it's not historical footage of things. It's not even really a recreation of historical footage. So I say it's based on a true story, but it's also uh, to some degree fictionalized and a script is created, right? I mean, this is not from transcripts. I mean, we, we've seen some, some movies, including uh, when we watched Judgment at Nuremberg uh, a while back, right? Where there's actually transcripts of the trials and some of those things find their way into the, uh, uh, the screenplay for, for that movie. So, um, so it's sort of a, a strange and almost kind of a paradoxical idea that you'll, you'll make a fictional, fictionalized film to prove the actual um, historical importance of something, right? Um, uh, at the time that the movie came out, there actually were some uh, studies uh, done by university professors and things, uh, things like that, where they asked people uh, questions about uh, the Holocaust before they saw the movie and after they saw the movie. And Spielberg's point of view actually seemed to, at least in the short term, be proved right, that once people saw this movie, they were... Uh, a more uh, understanding of what had happened to the Jewish community in Europe, and they were uh, less susceptible to the claims that it never happened, right? So, uh, so a, a kind of a peculiar thing. And so, you know, we've watched a couple of other movies with Holocaust content. Uh, I, I made a case early on for some of you who watched it with us uh, about the movie The Pawnbroker from the 1960s. The, what an extraordinary movie about the Shoah, uh, the pawnbroker is. Uh, I'd say that Sidney Lamette, when he made the pawnbroker, had none of the concerns that Steven Spielberg had. It didn't occur to him that there might ever be anybody who said that the Holocaust didn't happen. So, uh, so Spielberg had something entirely different uh, in his mind uh, and is speaking to an entirely different generation than um, than than Sidney Lumet was when he made The Pawnbroker in, you know, uh, what, almost 30 years before, right? Um, so I also read that he was offered this and he said, no, he had already done The Porn Broker. And I also read something about Morton Scorsese being asked, and I think he said, I'm not Jewish. Yeah, Martin, that's right. Martin Scorsese uh, uh, said that he wasn't the right guy for this either. Uh, um, interestingly enough, um, Spielberg apparently was working on uh, the re remake of Cape Fear, uh, which he sort of handed off to Scorsese. Um, so Martin Scorsese ends up making uh, um, uh, Cape Fear rather than Steven Spielberg. There, there's, a, there's a lot of stories about this, including, you know, some of the people who uh, they were looking at to play some of the parts. You, you may have seen some of these things that there, there was some talk about uh, Dustin Hoffman playing the Itzhak Stern part, for example. Uh, and one of the main things that kept that from happening appears to have been some kind of miscommunication uh, that Steven Spielberg got heard that Dustin Hoffman had turned it down uh, when he hadn't actually. Um, so uh, I, uh, I, I, he's a fine actor. I mean, it's hard to imagine uh, him in the role rather than Ben Kingsley, you know, but that's because of how good Ben Kingsley is in the role, I think. Um, so, um, you know, uh, the the stranger ones are who they were thinking about uh, for Liam Neeson's role as Oscar Schindler, uh, including, um, uh, among other people, uh, Harrison Ford from Raiders of the Lost Ark was offered uh, the part, they talked to Warren Beatty about the part. Kevin Costner's name was in the ring. 
and most astoundingly, Mel Gibson. So, uh, yeah, one can only imagine. Can you imagine? Uh, I, you know, there's a part of me wants to say that uh, it would have been really great for Mel Gibson to play this role. He might have learned something, right? I mean, it might have might have changed his whole life uh, if he had gotten this part. Um, but it, but uh, it also makes me wonder if uh, uh, you know the 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 document would exist the way it does today if uh, Mel Gibson had gotten that part. So uh, perhaps he would have been more of a natural for the uh, concentration camp, uh, uh, you know, director. So, um, so it's, uh, uh, so we see who did get the parts, of course, uh, Liam Neeson, who, um, you know, the, the Liam Neeson was not unknown at the time, neither was Ray Fiennes, but neither one of them had become the big stars that they really become. Uh, um, uh, Liam Neeson had been around for uh, over a decade, I think, before this, uh, before this movie. I mean, his first role was in a, uh, it was a television adaptation of Pilgrim's Progress. Uh, I first remember seeing him in a movie um, by John Borman about the King Arthur story called Excalibur that came out in 1981. So that's 12 years before this. So he um, kind of labored as a character actor in small parts until this, uh, until this movie. And of course, after this movie, he became uh, a huge star and, and, um, um, and certainly a big star in, in, you know, action movies and things that uh, even now he's in, you know, violent action movies, you know, it's sort of a surprising turn and um, for him. Um, Ray Fiennes, who plays Amon Goeth, uh, um, has been nominated for the Oscar twice, once for this and another time for The English Patient uh, several years later. But he's also best known uh, to the next generation for having appeared in all of the Harry Potter movies, right? uh, playing uh, the, the, the bad guy, the uh, Voldemort in the, the Harry Potter movies. Uh, before he was uh, in this movie, uh, he was in a couple of movies. Uh, and so th this is pretty early in his career, but he plays uh, Heathcliff in a remake of Wuthering Heights uh, a year or two before this. And he actually plays uh, T.E. Lawrence, uh, Lawrence of Arabia, in a movie called A Dangerous Man, which I've never seen. But uh, I'm uh, given to understand that, um, uh, that that's what Spielberg saw him in and, and thought that he would be good for this role. Um, so it, it's, um, it, it's a big chance, in a sense, for, for an actor to take on a role like this. You know, there's the chance you'll never be cast as anything else ever again if you do it too well, right? And, and he has man, managed to weather that and become an actor who's done everything from uh, light comedy to Shakespeare, um, you know, on stage and in movies, uh, a consummate uh, actor, part of that next generation of British actors that comes after the people like the Olivier's and uh, so forth. So, um, so uh, and, and then of course, Ben Kingsley, who is already uh, um, probably the biggest name in the cast at, at the time, right? Not, not probably, he was. He was the best known, biggest, you know, he'd already won an Oscar for playing Gandhi in, I believe that was 1982. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, he's uh, uh, been in many different kinds of movies, many different roles over the, over the years, but uh, he was certainly the, the biggest star in the movie at the time, although I, I'm not sure he was yet, uh, you know, he was not yet Sir Ben Kingsley. And, um, you know, so, uh, uh, so in some sense, I think it was important for Steven Spielberg. He didn't want the the sort of cast that everyone recognizes, right? Um, you know, again, imagine if if Schindler had been played by Warren Beatty or somebody like that, right? You know, it's it, I I think in the end that's not what um, um, what Spielberg wanted. So, 
Um, he chose to make this movie in black and white. I mean, I think part of that is the, uh, uh, the there is a, a an attempt, even though of course the movie is not a documentary to use some techniques that look like documentary. And uh, you, the use of black and white is of course able to stand in for those uh, movie real kinds of uh, newsreel kind of footage uh, that are, is created for this movie, but uh, wants to look older, right? Wants, wants to remind us of a time gone by. Um, so the uh, screenplay is written by a, a guy of Armenian descent, actually, Stephen Zylian. Um, he'd already written a few movies by the time he did this, including, um, I, I think his first movie was The Falcon and the Snowman in 1985. In 1990, he wrote uh, the movie Awakenings right, uh, uh, with Robert De Niro. Um, uh, more recently, uh, he's written uh, other movies with, uh, with, for um, Martin Scorsese and a number of other folks and uh, um, has a, a long career as a screenwriter. So um, the other actors, um, probably not many of them look familiar to you. Uh, so again, I'd say that that was deliberate in, in all of these different uh, uh, roles to, to cast people who are not well known to, uh, to movie going audiences. There's also an international character to the cast and there, there's a few of the actors are uh, um, uh, Israeli. Um, there, there's some that are Italian and uh, Polish and so not, you know, in, in the various different speaking roles. Um, so uh, in the, the, not many of them have gone on to become stars in, in their own right. Um, we've got a few others who've appeared in some other things. Probably the, the, the most uh, notable among them is M. Beth Davids, who's South African, and she plays Helen Hirsch in this movie, which of course is a very emotional and important role in the film. Um, uh, had roles in, uh, in, on TV in the, the TV series, Ray Donovan and Mad Men. And uh, um, in movies, she's been in Bridget Jones' Diary and Girl with the Dragon Tattoo. And uh, she's in another movie uh, uh, with Liam Neeson, I think called Fallen. Um, best known to uh, a younger generation, perhaps for her role as a teacher in the movie Matilda. Um, so, uh, but really most of the others uh, are names that are not particularly familiar to me. Um, perhaps you've, you've seen them in one thing or another, but uh, um, most of them have not, um, not been in a lot of things, so. Um, what else, uh, anything else about production? Uh, I, I wanna to turn to the, the technique and some of these things a little bit more, um, you know. Uh, um, before you go, um, while we're yeah. still in production, can you talk about where it was filmed? Because yeah. I know it was filmed in Poland, obviously they went to Israel for the last scene. Yes, yeah. And they were actually given permission to film in Auschwitz. Um, but uh, but Spielberg, Spielberg actually chose not to film inside. Uh, he had the, this sense, I think, of uh, it being something like hallowed ground, and he didn't really want to do that. That said, they rebuilt a concentration camp. Um, the, they, you know, the, this was, uh, you know, nowadays, uh, uh, a lot of things that might have been done with special effects and miniatures and a variety of things like that were not yet really the, the way things were done in 1993. Um, so, um, so they rebuilt the concentration camp um, so that uh, they could uh, film in real space in a sense. So, um, so, so that was all rebuilt. This is the the, the most expensive uh, black and white film ever made, actually. Um, so, um, uh, and as I said, Spielberg didn't really expect that any, any profit would come from this. So that was a big surprise to him. 
Um, but so, so it was mostly filmed in Poland, uh, so a little bit in Israel. Can tell you that that ending was not really a part of the screenplay when they started making the movie. It was, uh, uh, they were actually in production in Poland when Spielberg decided that uh, uh, they needed this for the end of the movie. And um, so uh, somewhat hastily, they, they gathered together as many of the survivors, you know, the, the folks on the list as they could find, uh, and brought them all to Israel for uh, that very moving final scene, you know, where they uh, play stones on Schindler's grave. Uh, that grave, by the way, if you don't know, is in Jerusalem. It's just outside the walls of the old city. There's a, a Christian cemetery there on, on, uh, on the hillside. Um, I, in my visits to Israel, I've gone by there many times. Some the, the hours seem to be particularly erratic. So, uh, um, but I have on occasion been able to go inside um, and, uh, and see the stones piled on the, on the stone for, uh, for Schindler. Um, you can, if you even even when the cemetery is closed, if you get to just the right spot at the gate and stuff, you you can see it. But um, but but it's only on uh, rare occasions on visits to Israel that I've actually been able to go inside and and show people. So um, um, uh, so turning to the uh, the the film itself, there's a couple of things I want to point out that. You know, this is a movie uh, of course, about uh, the the Shoah, about the Jewish experience. Uh, the name Hitler is only mentioned twice in this movie, in three hours. It, it's I, that's has to be deliberate, right? You know, this is not an accident of of the screenplay or something like that. It's a question of focus and things like that. And the only time that's mentioned, it's uh, both times are in the contents. To, uh, in the context of one of the uh, uh, German soldiers saying "Heil" to Hitler, and the last, the 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 last time is the la they're the last words that are spoken in the movie. Right, Amon Goeth says it before he's hanged, um, and that's one of the two times that the name Hitler is mentioned. So I think that that's a uh, very deliberate. Uh, I'm, I think that there there's. Uh, this text is complicated, and a three-hour movie is bound to be complicated, but there's a couple of things you, you might think about. Uh, one is that the, this movie wants to focus on the experience of the Jewish community, right? Uh, on, on Oscar Schindler, of course, but on the experience of the Shoah, um, which in some sense is, is not to be attributed to just the one person, right, at the at the top of the heap, so to speak. Um, so it's, uh, um, it wants to take the focus off of that. And, you know, what is Hitler planning and who's planning it and all of that stuff. Instead, uh, um, put it somewhere else, right, which is also sort of a reminder, perhaps that, you know, if there weren't people who were willing to go along, right, this could not have happened. Right? So um, so I, I think that's that's a very deliberate act in the uh, in the in the screenplay. Then the filmmaking itself. Um, uh, um, Spielberg says that this is his most intuitive film. That um, um, and it is true that that you know uh, um, over time Spielberg has become an extraordinary filmmaker and has an extraordinary reputation. But early in his career, one of the, the complaints about him is that he was not intuitive, right? He wasn't artistic in a sense, that he was, uh, um, uh, everything was so planned that, that nothing, uh, nothing felt meaningful in a sense. So the idea that, th this is, that he didn't plan out everything, um, uh, is uh, is an interesting comment on the filmmaking itself. About half of the film is filmed with handheld cameras, and about half is uh, with with steady cams. And uh, uh, there are no cranes in this movie, but there are uh, camera cam mounted cameras and handheld cameras 
Uh, and, um, you know, timing it out, I think it's about uh, 40 to 45 percent of the time uh, they use handheld cameras. Now, they, how that comes across, you know, you know, this is the sort of thing that sometimes works on us somewhat subliminally. We, we don't necessarily pay that much attention to it. It's one of the reasons why I wanted to call your attention to it before we watched it last week. And hopefully some of you were able to notice that. Um, the thing about handheld cameras, I mean, there's, there's a couple of things about it. Uh, obviously, they're not as steady. The image moves. It, it, it's jerky. Um, and it's a way of creating a kind of a, a, a verisimilitude of the action, right? That it, this, this is you know, documentary filmmakers often are using handheld cameras because uh, they're trying to capture a moment as quickly as they can without, um, without um, the time to set up special lighting and all these different kinds of things. So by using the handheld uh, cameras, uh, it gives this sense as if this, this is real footage, you know, this is uh, documentary footage, this is found footage, uh, when of course we know that it is a, all created footage, but it still acts on us as, as if it's real, right? So it brings a kind of an immediacy to it. Um, the, uh, the, the steady shots, on the other hand, give us some remove from the action. And the, the scene that I've actually shown, and maybe some of you, I, I see Jim's on the call, he's probably seen me show this clip before, is the scene of the liquidation of the ghetto, where um, Schindler is watching it from up above, uh, riding a horse, right? And the horse riding through the countryside with his current lover by his side on another horse is done with a steady shot, right? But the, the shots that are down below in the, in the ghetto at its liquidation are all handheld, jerky, you know. And by the end of that scene, the camera switches okay? so that the camera from above that views the, the little girl in the red coat, and we'll talk about color in this movie in a minute, but um, that's a steady shot, not a handheld camera. But now when the camera focuses on Schindler on his horse, it's a handheld camera. The horse is in and out of the frame. There's a kind of a, uh, you know, the, the, there is with, embedded within the use of the camera, the, the change of perspective that, uh, that Schindler undergoes perhaps in this moment, right? Now, the, the, the story of Schindler's life may be a little more complicated than that, but the, the movie making is, is, makes this very clear transition, right? That the, um, this is the moment where Schindler absorbs the lesson and moves from being what he is, a kind of a callow war profiteer in the early parts of the story to becoming a guy who spends everything he makes to save lives, right? So that scene, that little girl in the red coat is the catalyst for the change and the camera shows it to us. So it's an extraordinary piece of filmmaking, I'd say. I mean, it, it's one of those places where everything um, works together. Uh, and as I said, these things often work on us in an almost subliminal kind of way where we don't really notice cameras and what they're doing. Um, and, um, you know, but, but they're, they're at work, right? And so it's an extraordinary piece of direction. So um, I do want to mention color for a minute. Of course, the, the little girl in the red raincoat, that's so important. Uh, and then later in the movie, when, um, when the command comes that all of those bodies that have been buried have to be dredged up and burned, you see her again, you see her coat again. And um, there, there is uh, uh, a, a little bit more color in the movie. Um, you may have noticed that at the beginning, the very beginning of the movie, how does it begin? It begins with uh, the Jewish community prior to all, all of the, these things happening in Poland. So it begins with the lighting of Shabbat candles and um, uh, that's in color, right? And gradually, the uh, color seeps out of the 
out of the image, right? Until the last bit of color is drained away, right? And, uh, again, beautiful, thoughtful symbolism, right? Of, you know, the vibrancy of Polish Jewish life from uh, a thousand years of culture and uh, uh, faith and, um, you know, art and all of those things, right? Drained away by the Shoah. So there is the, this place where the, the last little flicker of the candle burns down in gutters at the end of that opening scene is the last little bit of blue flame at the base of the candle is gone and everything becomes black and white, right? Um, uh, the color is drained away from it. The, uh, the girl in the red raincoat and then near the end of the movie in a, again, sort of a lovely parallel Right there, uh, Schindler speaks to one of the, the men working in the factory. He says to him, Rabbi, okay, uh, you know, what are you doing working? Uh, reminding him that it is Friday and that Shabbat is coming and tells him that there's, uh, I think, wine in the office. And so for a brief moment in this dark, dark place, the, the candles are lit again, the blessings are sung again like they are at the beginning, and for a brief moment there's color, right, in those candles once again. Right? And then, of course, the final scene in Israel uh, is in color, right? So, uh, and I'd say symbolic here of, of the survival of the Jewish people, right, of the, uh, uh, the community coming back to life. Uh, and um, so uh, each of those things is, is uh, thought out. So, so for all of uh, Spielberg saying that this is his most intuitive movie, uh, I'm sure that he's right, and I'm sure that it is, but it is also, uh, a, there's a thought out plan to all this, right? <coughs> so, uh, you know, it's, uh, some of my uh, favorite bits of technique in this movie. I see Sue's had her hand up for I'm sure others have some things to say too, but Sue, do you want to unmute? Yeah, I have a, a couple of things. First of all, I, I did notice the handheld camera. I always notice handheld cameras because I get motion sick. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I have spent many hours in movies with my husband with my eyes closed. <laughs> right, right. But um, at any rate, I did manage to watch this and and realized the changes. Mm -hmm. um, but I have um, a couple of questions and one comment. First of all, my comment about the fact that Hitler's name is only mentioned twice. I, I think, and I'm wondering if you agree, that it, it's mainly to uh, kind of blame the entire Ger German community, mm -hmm. that they were all complicit and uh, they allowed this to happen. And uh, in spite, you know, and so it was, yes, Hitler started it all, but he couldn't have accomplished it without the, uh, uh, the complicity of his entire nation. Yeah, uh, yeah I so definitely think that's part of it, right? And I, I uh, not just the Germans, of course, right? Because, uh, you know, you have scenes like um, the scene where the, the train is heading to Auschwitz and you've got a little Polish girl, you know, outside uh, saying goodbye, Jews. Right. You know, um, right. So even even the children know, uh, at least in the text of this movie, um, the, you know, uh, I'm not going to speak to the historicity of everything in this movie. Right. But that's um, and the other thing that I felt was unrealistic, and when you talk about him being intuitive, was when they showed the scenes of the women and the men in the barracks, and in the, they all looked too healthy. There right. there weren't any horribly skinny skeletal like people like we know they were and, and this is I a problem found that very right. unrealistic yeah there's a this is part of that peculiar paradox of uh, I, I've told people about this movie you know that somewhere there's probably an ad in a newspaper looking for extras you know to come and be part of these scenes in in concentration camps right you know, so you've got a casting director somewhere who's looking at people saying, okay, this one is thin enough and that one's not thin enough. And none of them are thin enough to, 
you know, it's impossible and you wouldn't want, you know, you wouldn't want what it takes, right, to to look like uh, um, the 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 actual documentary evidence. Yeah. So um, so it's they should it's have gone. Familiar. They sh they should have made these people go on a diet or something. I don't know. But it yeah. just seemed very, you know, um, it just didn't go with me. Yeah, I would say there's no diet that gets you to that, right? It was know. not the first time I saw the movie, but I looked at it this time through a more critical eye, I think, than I have before. Yeah, absolutely. And and that's something that I, I noticed as well. Uh, it, on the other hand, uh, um, uh, Ray Fiennes actually gained 27 pounds to, to play the part uh, of the, the concentration camp uh, uh, commandant, you know, so... Uh, Thank you. Yeah. We have um, Alice, then Sandy. Alice, go ahead. Yeah. Um, well, Rabbi, I, I took to heart you saying, you know, watched the movie, you know, looking for technique. Um, because, you know, I, I mean, I think I had only seen it once, but it, it's, you know, it was pretty ingrained in my head. But the, the two, two techniques that I noticed that I really felt like raised the level of the artistry of this movie. And I don't know if this was Spielberg or the cinematographer or both of them together, but so many of the close-ups, there was a play of dark and light on the faces. Sometimes it was vertical, you know, half of the face was in light and half of it was in dark. And sometimes it was like, you couldn't see the people's eyes. And I think a lot of that were the um, you know various commanders of the concentration camp? There was this one scene where he's talking, I think, to Schindler, and you don't see his eyes; they're just all in shadow. That that oh my god, that really uh, tug. I don't know. It just made a big impression on me. All those close-ups, and then one other thing, I, I noted it one time, but I think it was many times where I think. I mean, this is the director and also the editor that they put different scenes together. The one that I wrote down was there was a Jewish wedding and the breaking yes. of glass. There was Schindler and um, he was with a woman in a club and there was this singing. And then right after that, it was Eamon Goth beating Helen, you yeah. know, and it was like, the combination of those three scenes, you know, one right after another, I thought also was very, very effective emotionally in where, where it brought me as a viewer. Yeah, yeah, beautiful. Uh, cutting back and forth among those three things, and the sound of one is sometimes playing while the other one is going on. I mean, this, this is this is movie making, you know, and this is why uh, uh, the movie won the Oscar for editing, right? So movies are a collaborative art, so it's very hard to say. So is was this was this Spielberg? Was this the the uh, the the author of the screenplay? Was it uh, you know? Does it all get done in the editing room? You know, it, it's uh, it's hard to answer that question. I mean, it's a, a or the cinematographer, as you mentioned particularly the light and dark and, and the eyes and those things. Uh, you know, I think the best answer to those things is that this is always a, 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 uh, a, a group effort, you know, a collaboration among artists uh, uh, who create these things. Uh, I think you're absolutely right. There's no question that, that uh, uh, the, 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 the light and shadow, I mean, it's, it's about good and bad and human nature, I think, I mean, part of it. Um, uh, the, the obscuring of what people's real intentions are and those kinds of things. And, and uh, um, while in another kind of movie, we might talk about, uh, you know, this is film noir is, is uh, you know, the Hollywood version, right? The, uh, um, you know, the Maltese Falcon and that sort of thing that it's, it's often case where um, um, you know, the, famously something like the light through Venetian blinds, you know, is reflected on the face of a character or something like that. So it, it's absolutely intentional, you know, to uh, that, um, 
uh, darkening in a sense, um, you know, half dark, half light, and so forth. So, um, but and uh, and and that uh, that cutting uh, in between things, I, I wouldn't say that you know, uh, it's been it had been done in other movies. I mean, I, perhaps uh, one of the most famous is in uh, one of the Godfather movies, I think, where uh, uh, Michael Corleone is attending the christening of his daughter and at the same time uh uh his uh his uh enemies in the mob are being eliminated right and it's cutting back and forth between the the holiness of the church service and the uh um you know and and the 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 hits uh going out in the community so um so this is kind of a similar idea in a sense uh it's it's very effective and um and in this movie particularly so sandy you. you need to unmute you yeah. i think the movie's brilliant uh thank you for including it, it was really something seeing it again after all these years i agree with susan wallach that some of the characters, especially at the wedding scene, they look too zoptic. They really <laughs> they look like they were in a camp. But some years ago, possibly 15 years ago, I don't remember exactly, David and I went to Krakow and we took a train from, um, from Berlin to Krakow, spent time in Krakow and then returned to Berlin on another train, a different kind of a train, but the trains were very old, the trains that we went on. And um, I couldn't help but think about the Shoah and everything as I was traveling, because it's quite a few hours between Berlin and Krakow. It's around the train. It's somewhere between nine and 12 hours, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, while we were in Krakow, Two of the things that I remember were going to some synagogues. I believe there are three that they list on most tourist sheets that you can still go to visit these synagogues in Krakow. And in one, I remember that when we get, got in the door, a woman approached us. She was a terrible looking woman. It was um, a large, sort of uh, unattractive stupid looking woman. And she asked us for money. And we thought maybe it's for charity, you know, for a Jewish charity or something. And she said, no, this is her money for allowing us in the shul and to walk around in there. And we paid her money. I forgot what the charge was. And we walked around and there were outside of the main part of the synagogue, there were separate rooms and they all stunk of urine. Like people had come in there and urinated on the floors. I don't know if that was an anti, certainly Jews wouldn't go in there and urinate on the floor of a synagogue. But I had the impression that somebody had done that on purpose, either workmen or someone like is an insult to the Jews. It wasn't a pleasant thing at all going to, to this one synagogue. Yes. And then it's ever there's one <coughs> restaurant that advertises itself in Krakow as being Steven Spielberg's favorite restaurant. <laughs> and it was his favorite restaurant when he was making Schindler's List. So we went there and they even have Jewish stars, you know, shining outside the restaurant. Almost everything on the menu was pork. Almost yeah. everything. Now I'm not kosher, so I don't care. But there, almost every dish was a pork dish there. And, you know, it had attracted, there was a busload of people from Highland Park getting on a bus that had just been through having dinner there when we arrived to have dinner. And I met some people who I later connected with here in Chicago. But it was just such a weird thing. I would never go back to Poland again. Yes. When, I, when I we left say, Auschwitz been... and went on that bus back to Krakow from Auschwitz, 
after having visited the salt mines where there's Hebrew writing in the walls. And they don't, they never tell you that Jewish slave labor was used to work in those salt mines that are so famous outside of Krakow. On that bus back, you, you pass farms and people, they can't say they didn't smell it, know about it. I mean, it, it's like the biggest lie on earth. Yeah, so I can tell you, I've been to Krakow in more recent years. Uh, they, they have cleaned their act up considerably in, in, in that regard. Uh, and um, there's actually a, a pretty vibrant Jewish community in Krakow these days, in, including uh, there's a wonderful JCC there where I had Shabbat dinner the last time I was uh, in Krakow. So, uh, and there's a Jewish festival in Krakow every summer which is is pretty it's pretty extraordinary how uh how the, these things are coming back and that said it is it, it's such a peculiar experience to be a jew in poland uh as a tourist or whatever i mean it, it's just um um you know to there are many people there enjoying themselves in krakow i mean they're they're there for the uh the chocolate and for the beer and for the things. And I, I just can't even imagine what it's like to be a tourist in, in Krakow, right? You know, to, to not be there, uh, to have a, 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 a great portion of what my, uh, what I'm doing when I, I go to Krakow is I'm mourning, you know? Um, there, there's a, uh, a moment where, uh, you know, right before the, the liquidation of the ghetto, where uh, Amon Goh talks to the, the soldiers who are about to do this, and he says, today is history and you're a part of it. For six centuries, there's been a Jewish Krakow. By evening, it's just a rumor, <laughs> right? And so when, when Jews visit Poland, you know, so much of what... Um, what we feel, you know, is, is tied into that uh, destruction of a culture that, that was there for so many centuries before that, right? Um, you know, some of that is, is coming to mind in recent days with what's going on in the Ukraine, you know, as well, uh, which uh, Hubert's question before we even started today was, um, you know, when the Russian soldier comes and finds them and tells them they've been liberated, and, you know, where should we go? And he says, well, don't go east and don't go west, you know, uh, right? I mean, that was the experience of that moment. But, you know, uh, here we are. I mean, what an extraordinary moment it is that the president of the Ukraine is Jewish, right? Uh, a community where, you know, I, I mean, my my family left there because because of pogroms at the at the very beginning of the 20th century, uh, between something like 1918 and 1920, at the rise of uh, uh, you know of the Soviets in Russia, I mean, 100,000 Jews were were killed in uh, in Ukraine in those days. So um, so it does in that in that brief scene near the end of the movie. This is where are Jews supposed to go, right? You know. Um, and of course, it's not like they were welcome here at that point in history as well, right? That uh, one of the reasons the Holocaust is as deep and uh, um, successful as it was is that the Jews weren't really welcome anywhere else, right? Um, you know, America had passed uh, a variety of laws to keep us out, and, um, and we're not interested in changing those laws in the face of what was going on during the during the war so um so that that scene looms large in a sense and and continues to have uh, you know repercussions in the in the present day so um there there is still uh anti-jewish feeling in some places but it, it's quite remarkable uh, that you know the president of Ukraine is Jewish, right? And that the the Vladimir Putin is talking about the denazification of Ukraine, you know, at, at this moment. 
So I see, Jim, you've got your hands up, hand up and, you know, I'm happy to have an expert on here. So I don't know that that's what you got, <laughs> but, but I've been steeped in it in the movie. I've only I've lost track how many times I've sat through the movie. I just about memorized it. Um, but but I was really talking, thinking about what you were saying in terms of what followed the war and and Hubie's question and so on. And, and I think part of the answer to don't go east, they hate you there is the fact that if you look at the memorials that were constructed within, let's call it the Soviet Union, because that will pick up Ukraine and the Baltic states and so on. For the most part, none of them even mention the Jews. Yeah. The memorials are, I mean, the, 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 the Soviets and now the Russians teach that this was about what happened to the Russian people. And there's, it's not about the Jews. They're really just a, a bystander in the whole, you know, off to the side of the whole thing. Right. I felt that when I was in Poland too, this sense of, uh, you know, the, the Poles suffered terribly under the German rule. And, and so they're victims, right? You know, so they don't really think about the Jews as being victims. They don't even consider the war over in 1945. If you look at the museum and the Schindler factory, it's all about how the war continued till 1989 and the end of the, the Soviet dominance over Poland. And as far as they're concerned, it was all one, one war. Yeah, yeah. It, it you know, if it, if it wasn't so tragic, you know, and if there weren't still such repercussions, it would just be fascinating, right? So, so quite a remarkable thing. So um, we're just about out of time. Of course, this is a three hour movie. There's much more that we could talk about. Uh, um, um, you know, the, there's a lot of sort of themes in here, but, but of course in, in the end, uh, you know, it, the, uh, the plot is important. And, and this idea that any one of us can save somebody, right? And so that the, uh, the line on the ring that they give him, uh, that the factory workers give to him, uh, uh, you know, to, uh, from the Talmud, indeed it is, uh, to save one life is to save the world entire. And, and the sense that we, uh, and what we see at the end of the movie, when we see the, the, the survivors themselves and descendants of the survivors coming and placing stones on Schindler's grave, uh, in the credits at the time, I'm not sure if these numbers still hold up uh, today. I don't think so, not exactly. But it said uh, there are 4,000 Jews in Poland. There are 6,000 Schindler Jews in the world, right? So, so um, more than the uh, entire That's Jewish right. population of the country wow. of Poland. So... Um, but in the, that final scene, you see all of these folks come and put the stones on there, and then someone puts roses on the grave. That is Liam Neeson. Um, and the credits say um, that in memory of six million. Right? So, and uh, the credits continue to roll over that road of gravestones right? that uh, the Nazis used uh, the, the gravestones from. Uh, one of the uh, from many of the the Polish Jewish cemeteries and turned them into uh, um, roads and and construction materials in general. So um, so you can still see some of that. Uh, uh, amazingly, in Warsaw, there is still a Jewish cemetery that's relatively intact. Uh, some other Jewish cemeteries are gone, but there is at least one that is. Uh, intact and and it actually uh, uh one of the strange things about visiting poland is is that the most joyful places of jewish life in poland are the cemeteries uh, you go there and you see all those centuries of jews uh um you know artists and writers and all of those things and and visit the places where they're buried it's testament to a culture that existed up until 1939 and and then was uh um, worn away over the next uh, five five years, but um, you know, so so you get to the place where I see the the burial places of rabbis whose works I've been reading for the last forty years, you know, and you see uh, um, the place where someone like I. L. Peretz is buried, you know, wrote these amazing short stories and uh, chronicled Jewish life in in 
Europe, you know. So um, so that's sort of a paradox. And in Warsaw, you can still see that. So um, um, I so know, I, but we have a hard stop, Rabbi, at three. No. Julie has a question, and then I have one quick announcement. Julie, go ahead. Well, I don't have a question, but I was going to um, tell you, if you don't know, about Amon Goeth's daughter and granddaughter. Rabbi, are you familiar with that story? No, I am. I'm not. Okay. Um, he had a daughter. He, he was divorced twice and um, had an affair and a love affair with this woman toward at the very last year or two of the war and had this daughter, Monica. Monica grew up, the woman loved him forever after he was hanged, that she could only see how unrighteous that was. And Monica was raised to believe that, by her mother to believe that her father was like the savior of that concentration camp, not the terrorist of it, not the murderer, the mother um, and, and in her adult, there's a, a movie where I got most of this information called Hitler's Children. You can see it on YouTube. And it talks about, about five or six children of some of the worst Nazis, Himmler and, um, the, and Amon Goeth and, and several others. And how these children, as they grew up, how they're surviving and what their life has been like being the children of these monsters. But she always thought her father was wonderful. And if he hadn't been so good to the people in the concentration camp, their lives would have been terrible. She eventually goes into some kind of cafe or something and talks to the bartender who tells her in the course of the conversation that he had been a prisoner in that camp. And she, thinking that he's gonna be thrilled to know, tells him that her father was the commandant there. And he practically passes out from shock. And, and it's that time that she learns what was really the truth of her father. She tells her mother, who you know, was the lover, um, who loved him all those years, she tells the mother who very soon after committed suicide. Monica had an, she, she wrote a book called something like, I don't have to love my daddy, do I? And she had, she had an affair with an Algerian and African-American and had a mulatto daughter, Jennifer, whose last name is now Teague. Jennifer Teague spoke at the Highland Park Library many years ago and was telling her story. And um, she was a psychologist. She's married. I don't know if she's married to a white man or not, or a black man, but she went, she, she was at the library and sees, um, this row of books that are all kind of dark color, but then one was red and stood out. And so she looked at it and the title of the book was, I don't have to love my daddy, do I? And she said that the, she was taken by the title. So she starts to look through it and realizes that the author of this book is her mother. And she's the, learning from the, this book about her grandfather and um, her mother had actually when, when she was about six or seven, gave her up either to a foster care or adoption, I forgot what, but it's a remarkable story. I really recommend this film, Hitler's Children, and the book, um, oh, oh, her, so she, Jennifer, then went on to write a book, and which is why she came to the Highland Park Library, and the title of her book is, My Grandfather Would Have Shot Me. The whole family story is quite remarkable. There's other documentaries about them. And um, I just wanted to pass that along. Julie, Great. thank you. The other thing that Steven Spielberg did is he had the Holocaust, um, the Shoah Foundation. I just put that link in the the chat. If you there's so we could go on talking forever. There's just so many um, things that this movie mentions. Rabbi, one last word. I was going to say that the proceeds from this movie from Spielberg go into the Shoah Foundation. Uh, he's never taken any uh, profit from making oh. this movie. Uh, it's interesting. So I, I would say, uh, you know, next week we're going to look at a, a very different view of the Holocaust and Inglorious Bastards. Um, so uh, I just say in, the, in this moment, you know, the, we are very lucky that the most persuasive filmmaker of a generation chose to make a movie. Uh, to prove to people that these things really happened. 
Um, and I'll leave you with that thought as you uh, watch Inglorious Bastards in the coming week. Okay. Thank you, everyone.